His body was twisting incessantly, both his face and body were discolored with a nauseating purple hue, his eyes rolled back and forth in his head, and every time he struggled to rise, he fell heavily to the ground again, never making it to his feet. Since Prince Siddhartha was so very compassionate, he quickly approached the man and held him up, placing his head upon his own knee, and so making him feel more comfortable, and then asked what caused the pain and why he could not stand up. The man tried to say something, but he did not even have the strength to speak. Chana hastily approached, and the prince asked, Chana, tell me why this man is in this strange condition look how he is breathing why does he not answer me? Chana shouted in horror, don't touch this man he is a sick person. Poisons flows in his veins, and toxic poisons are burning inside him, making it difficult for him to breathe, so that soon he will stop breathing. The prince asked, will other people be like this could I, too, become like this? Chana answered, if one comes into close contact with him, one may very possibly become like him. My prince, please lay him down and don't touch him, for the poison of the disease in his body may be passed on to you, and then you may well become sick like him Chana apart from this illness are there other serious illnesses? Yes, there are many, and they are all in the same way painful, are there no people who can help can't mankind conquer the sickness when it attacks that's too frightful? It is very common, and no one knows on what day he will get sick, for one can get sick anytime and any place, is it true, Chana? Anybody may get ill, including my whole clan, and even me, yes, even you may get sick also. If it is like this, then the existence of man in this world is only to be feared since nobody knows whether he might not. When he goes this evening to sleep, be transformed on the following morning into a sick man like that one Chana, is that so yes, it is so. No one in the world knows when he may become sick, suffer, and end by dying death what does it mean it's very strange, Chana want his death please, Prince, just look over there. The Prince looked where Chana directed him, and he saw a group of people marching along lamenting. For men in front carried a stiff, immobile person on a board, a person with shrunken cheeks and gaping mouth, speechless and ugly. Although the four men rocked the board quite sharply and clumsily, the person lying on top did not say a word. The prince watched the group moving along and began to wonder why they all wept and why the person on the board did not caution the carriers to proceed more carefully after moving on a little further. The group stopped. They placed the person they were carrying on top of a pile of wood and started a fire. The prince was shocked, and his hair stood on end. Yet the person continued sleeping quietly even as the fire began to lick his head and feet. The prince asked in a trembling voice saying, Chana, why does that man stay asleep and let them burn him? That man is dead he has feet, but can no longer walk on his ears, but can no longer hear it, is not conscious of anything. He has absolutely no feeling for heat, cold, fire, or snow he is already dead dead Chana this is death. Shall I, the son of the king, also died like that man. My father, Yesodara, and all the people I know, will they also someday be like that man on the pile of wood? Anybody who is alive will someday die there is no way to avoid it no one can live forever man cannot stop the coming of death. The prince remained silent and said no more, he felt the fearfulness of death imprisoning everybody, without there being a way to escape death. Prince Siddhartha quietly returned to the palace, went to his room, sat down alone and thought deeply about what he had seen finally he said to himself, it is too frightful that everybody in the world must die someday and that no one can prevent this ah there must be some way to avoid it. I shall do all I can to discover the way by which my father, Yesodara, myself and all other people will no longer be controlled by the power of old age, sickness and death I must do my best to find the way. Some time later, while the prince was riding in the garden, he saw a monk in a yellow robe. The prince watched the monk attentively, perceiving that his mind was full of peace and happiness. So the prince asked Chana, what is the life of this sort of person like? Chana replied, this is a person who cultivates the way, a person who has left his family and given up his desire for sense pleasures, in order to seek the way of deliverance from worldly suffering. The prince was very pleased to hear the name monk spoken. During that whole day, the prince sat quietly but happily in the garden, his mind captured by the idea of becoming a monk. Just then someone told the prince that his wife had given birth to a lovely boy. 
But instead of expressing his joy, the prince was a bit agitated and said absent-mindedly, a bond has been born a bond has been born. It was because the prince spoke in this manner just at this time, that the newborn baby was named Rakula, which means a bond or a fetter. Since the day of Rakula's birth, those who lived with Prince Siddhartha all clearly noticed that the prince has changed entirely he was more serious than before and more contemplative. King Sethadana was very worried, indeed, about his son's condition. And so he tried with his last effort to reawaken Siddhartha's interest in worldly things, by searching the whole country for the most intelligent and beautiful dancing girls. He lodged them permanently in the prince's palace, ordering them to sing beautiful songs and to perform pleasing dances, which, he hoped, would bring the prince pleasure and interest in the things of this world. At first the prince watched and listened to the dances and songs provided for him in order not to disappoint his father. But, in reality, these enchanting songs and dances attracted only a few inattentive glances from the prince, for his mind was concentrated on other things. The prince was thinking of one problem only that is, how to liberate himself and all other people completely from the fearful aging, sickness and death. Finally the prince became tired and fell asleep, and so the dancing girls had a chance to rest until the prince had awakened, and then they performed again. The prince woke up after a little while, finding that the dancing girls had all fallen asleep because of fatigue. While sleeping, they exhibited all kinds of ugly attributes, being entirely unaware of the impression that they were making some slept like pigs. Some opened their mouths, dripping saliva, which damaged the makeup on their faces some ground their teeth loudly like angry ghosts they all appeared to be quite ugly and disgusting. The prince was very surprised to see how the girls he liked so much could be transformed in this manner. This picture of the sleeping girls, once regarded as pretty and lovely by the prince, now appeared to be terribly ugly. It was, indeed, the most nauseating thing that had ever happened to the prince. Consequently, the prince became determined to shake off all that disturbed his mind, and to go out to search for real happiness and to become free from all pain and suffering. Prince Siddhartha rose silently, careful to avoid waking the girls, quietly left the room, and ordered Channa to get his horse Kahaka ready. While Channa was getting the horse, Prince Siddhartha felt that he should see his newborn son before he left. So he went to the room of Princess Yesodara, where he found the princess, holding the baby in her arms, sound asleep. The prince thought, if I move her hand, she will certainly wake up. If she wakes up, she will stop me from going. But I must go immediately, and I shall come back to see my son and his mother after I find the ultimate truth. In the silence of the night, Prince Siddhartha left the palace without waking anyone. He left the city riding his very understanding horse, Kahaka. Only Chana followed him, and no one hindered them. After riding for a little while, the prince stopped his horse and turned around, taking a final look at the city of Kapalabathu in the pure, bright moonlight but his will to go on was unshaken. Prince Siddhartha, riding his horse Kahaka, arrived at the banks of the Anoma River, by dawn. The prince dismounted, stood at the riverside, and took off the precious dress he was wearing. Then he handed it to Channa, resolutely ordering him to take it and Kahaka back to Kapalavathu and tell the king what had happened. At this time, Prince Siddhartha Gautama of the Sakya clan was 29 years old. He left his country and family to become a Srama in order to conquer all the pain and suffering of mankind. After Channa left him to go back to Kapalavathu, Siddhartha stayed for seven days in the mango grove of Anupia, near the bank of Anoma River. Then he journeyed southward and came to Rajagaha, the capital of the country of Magadha, the king of which was named Bimbisara. In the morning, he bathed in a stream near the city. Then, like all monks, he entered the city to beg for food. The people of Rajagaha, noticing the distinguished appearance of Siddhartha, offered him their best food. Having obtained his meal for the day, Siddhartha left Rajagaha, heading toward Pava Hill, where he ate his food. Since the day that Siddhartha had first begged for food in the city, the news had spread that a monk of a distinguished appearance and of serious and noble behavior had arrived this news also reached the palace. King Bimbisara, knowing of the presence of such a monk, sent his son to check out the situation. He discovered that this monk was the prince of Kapilavathu, the successor to the throne, 
who had given up everything and become a monk in search of the means to liberate all mankind from the imprisonment of old age, sickness, and death. Having this knowledge, King Bimbisara went to Pava Hill and invited Siddhartha to stay in his capital city, where it would be very convenient for the king to offer him food and all the necessities of life. But Siddhartha graciously declined the invitation, saying, I cannot remain in one place before realizing my goal and aspiration. So King Bimbisara made an agreement with Siddhartha that, when his aspiration of perfect enlightenment was realized, he would come first to the city of Rajagaha to instruct and enlighten King Bimbisara and his people. One day Siddhartha left Rajagaha to go to the foot of the mountain where many hermits and sages lived. On the way, he saw dust falling down from the mountain amidst the pounding sound of animal hoofs. Going closer, he found a large flock of sheep and goats moving along like a mass of clouds they were being helplessly driven towards the city. At the rear of the flock, a little lamb was straggling, limping along painfully, its leg wounded and bleeding. Siddhartha noticed the little lamb and its mother walking in front of it constantly looking back in deep concern for her offspring his heart was filled with compassion. So Siddhartha took the little lamb with its wounded leg up into his arms, gently holding it while walking along behind the flock. When he saw the shepherds, he asked, Where are you driving this herd to? They should normally be driven back in the evening. Why do you drive them back at noontime? The shepherds replied, The king is holding a big sacrifice today, and we have been ordered to bring 100 sheep and goats each to the city by midday. Siddhartha said, I'll go with you. He carried the little lamb in his arms all the way to the city. Walking behind the flock of sheep, Siddhartha reached the city. Then he went towards the palace, where the sacrifice was being held. The king and a group of priests of the fire-worshipping cult were chanting hymns, while a big fire was burning on the altar. They were about to kill the flock of sheep as a sacrifice, but when the leader of the fire-worshippers raised his sword to cut off the head of the first sheep, Siddhartha quickly moved up and stopped him. In a grave manner, Siddhartha stopped the action of the leader of the fire worshippers and persuaded the participants to discontinue the ceremony. He said to King Bimbisara, Your Majesty, don't let these worshippers destroy the lives of these poor animals. Then he told the worshippers themselves, Life is inconceivably precious. Those who want to destroy it should realize that once it is destroyed it can never be recovered. Siddhartha also spoke to people who were standing as witnesses to this event. All living creatures cling to life, just like human beings. Why should people exert brutal force upon these friendly animals? The suffering of birth, old age, sickness and death will naturally take away their beloved lives. Siddhartha continued, If human beings expect mercy, they should show mercy, because according to the law of cause and effect, those who kill will, in return, be killed. In short, if we expect happiness in the future, we must not intentionally harm any kind of creature. Because whoever sows the seeds of pain and suffering will undoubtedly reap the same fruits. The manner in which Siddhartha spoke to the king, the fire worshippers, and the people of Rajagaha was peaceful and full of compassion, yet, at the same time, forceful and determined. He completely changed the intention and belief of the king and the fire worshippers. So King Bimbisara again asked Siddhartha to stay in his country to teach the people to be compassionate and to protect animals. Siddhartha was deeply grateful to the king for his offer, but since he had not yet attained his goal of complete enlightenment, he once again gracefully declined the invitation and departed. Leaving Rajagaha, Siddhartha journeyed on towards the place where Rakalama the sage lived. Rakalama was one of the best-known scholars of that time, who had founded many institutes for learning of all kinds. Siddhartha stayed with Rakalama and studied very diligently under him. Soon his knowledge and capability could be favorably compared to his teachers, and he became recognized as a prominent and virtuous disciple of the old sage, a situation which made Rakalama very happy. One day Rakalama said to Siddhartha, now you know everything that I know and are able to teach as well as I can what I know you know equally well there is little difference between us stay here and help me teach the students. Siddhartha asked, don't you have anything else to teach me, master? Can't you tell me how to escape from old age, sickness and death? Rakalama made no reply, for he had taught Siddhartha all that he knew. 
What the sage Rakalama had taught Siddhartha consisted mainly of the knowledge of meditation, the way to make the mind very calm and then remain in the calm of samadhi, concentration, but this kind of knowledge was neither thorough nor ultimate. It failed to satisfy Siddhartha, for it did not provide an answer to the problems of life and death, old age and sickness, that had constantly occupied his mind.